Welcome to Your Family's Health, the program that focuses on health care issues with unique and different modalities for taking charge of your health today. Experts talk weekly with our continuing roster of guests from around the country and right here in Nassau County to keep you up to date on the latest health issues and trends. Take care of your mind, body, and soul. Spend the next half hour with the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC, and get on the journey to better health. Hello and welcome to Your Family's Health. My name is Dr. Janine Cookerard from the nursing department here at NASA Community College. And I'm here along with my co-host, Keith Garbarino. He is a nursing student. And today we're talking about a topic that is really spoken about. How you handle losing a body part and how do you help a family member that may have suffered that type of traumatic loss. My guest today is Dr. is Mr. David Ulrich, who is professor and co-director of Pacific New Media Foundation all the way in Honolulu, Hawaii. He teaches frequent classes and workshops and is an active photographer and writes whose work who has been published in numerous books and journals. His most recent book is called Zen Camera, Creating Awakening with a Daily Practice in Photography. Now, David is uniquely qualified to address these themes found in his book on creating and seeing uh, things in the environment and understanding how um, specifically how he lost his right uh, dominant eye and the impact of the injury um, at the age of 33. So David joins us via Skype. Welcome to your family's health on the voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. How are you doing, David? Good, good. Thank you for having me, Janine. I look forward to this conversation. Great. And I'm here with Keith Garbarino, a nursing student. Say hi, Keith. Hi, David. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so let us start with your, your injury. How did that happen? And tell us about that awful experience. Well, I had just bought a house in uh, Boston, and I had a dead tree on the property, which I had cut down. And I was out stacking the wood, and I threw a large log onto the pile, and a stick about three feet long with a crook in it came flying up and went right up under my eye. And my first thought was, oh no, I'm going to have to have stitches on my face. And my second thought, I'm an avid swimmer, is, oh no, I won't be able to swim today. I had no idea that my eye was damaged because there's no pain endings in the inner eye. When I went to the emergency room, the physician on duty exclaimed, oh my God, we have to call an eye doctor immediately. And he came in and it was at that point I understood that my eye had been seriously damaged. So David, talk about this irony. You are a (laughs) one-eyed photographer who writes about and teaches how to see with a camera. Well, you know, it's it's very interesting. Um, You opened this program with the question of how does one deal with losing a body part? My father had a leg amputated, so he was a one-legged person. So I grew up understanding the trauma and the difficulties of um, adapting to life with with one body part. Um, in my case, as a photographer, you depend very heavily on your eyes. You know, there's a there's a a comment in Zen when the Zen master comes up and whacks the student on the back of the head. Their ego is broken free, and they gain a new perspective to the world. I had a very similar experience. Although the injury was very traumatic, it really served to open me up more deeply to life. It served to expand my perception, my perspective, rather than contract it. And I really believe that uh, something in us rises up in response to adversity, and it's a strength. It's, It's a... It's a way of handling things that we wouldn't have experienced without the injury. And of course, as a photographer, when you're looking through a lens, you're looking through a monocular vision anyway, because a lens is a one-eyed vision. So it didn't affect my photography as, as much as it affected me as a human being. 
So um, it is often said and realized that strength really doesn't come from the physiologic body, but from someplace deep in within inside of ourselves. So I know that's what you're talking about. How can we tap into this force and recognize the essence of who we really are as individuals? How can we tap? Well, <clears throat> let me tell you a story. Um, I had two surgeries. The first was to see if they could repair the eye. The second surgery was to actually remove the eye. So prior to the second surgery, <clears throat> I had checked into the hospital. They wanted to give me a sedative. And I said, no, I really feel the need to experience this moment. And I was despondent. I was afraid. I didn't know what was going to happen. And I took a walk and I ended up at the hospital chapel. And I sat there and I had a realization. I realized if I can't let go of something as insignificant as a body part, what's going to have to happen when I let go of my whole body when I die? And that became a strong creative moment. I recognized that I am not my body. I recognized that there's a spirit, whatever animates us, um, is connected to the body, but is not the body. And I think we can begin to experience a strength. We can begin to experience a presence, a sense of self that is not related to our body type, our appearance. And it's a very empowering moment when one can experience that. So do you think it takes crisis uh, to reach this uh, epiphany or self-knowledge? You know, I tell my students, we, we have a little running joke. Um, one of the ways to access the right side of the brain, the creative, imaginative side of the brain, is through trauma, crisis, drugs. And then I ask my question, is that the only way? And no, I do not think it's the only way. I think there's many activities that can help us access our inner strength, our inner creativity. I would say contemplative activities like yoga, meditation. I would say that, that in involvement with art and creativity or music, I would say that um, <clears throat> listening to music, looking at art, dance, all of these things can open us to the creative side of ourselves and open us to this more expanded perception. All right, so David, how did this crisis impact your recovery? Well, what what's very interesting for me is I was already visually trained. I was a photographer. I studied art. <clears throat> and I had the opportunity to learn to see again as an adult. Most of us learn to see as children. It's a, it's a highly automatic process. But I had to learn to navigate space. I had to learn to drive a car. I had to learn to regain depth perception. All of those things that we learn as children, I had to learn consciously as an adult. So I really became interested and I came in touch with um, the growth and the process of recovering my vision, which was a very powerful and even creative activity. So you're listening to Your Family's Health on the voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Dr. Janine cook here with my co-host, Keith Garbarino. And today our special guest is David Ulrich, who's discussing his recent book called Zen Camera, Creative Awakening with a Daily Practice in Photography. So David, how did your family and friends play a role in the recovery, in your recovery? You know, I had a tremendous amount of support. It was very interesting. In my first surgery, they had to remove 60 or 80 fragments of dead splintered wood that was lodged in my optic nerve. What I didn't know is that I almost died because those splinters of wood could have resulted in an infection in my brain. So they tried to repair my retina, tried to, they had to rebuild the side of my face with cosmetic surgery. It took eight hours. When I went to sleep, my girlfriend was the only one that was there when she brought me to the hospital. When I woke up, my mother and brother from Ohio were there. 
my mother stayed with me during the process of losing the eye and recovery. My girlfriend was part of it. I have to say their support was very powerful. When I was in the hospital, many friends came to visit. Um, people were in horror over what happened, but they were very, very supportive, and their support helped me tremendously. So, how was your experience? How has your experience on disability affected your work as a photographer? Well, you say the word disability. Yep. I don't think of myself in that way. I actually believe that the experience was a gift. I believe that it helped expand my perception. Although my physical sight is reduced, I feel that my consciousness, my awareness has been expanded. So, I actually see this as an enabling gift rather than a disabling event. Yes, my vision is not as clear or as broad as it used to be, but my awareness is greater, my awareness is expanded, and I really believe a lot of that has to do with facing adversity, finding a strength within, and recognizing that adversity can open us in ways that are unexpected that we couldn't imagine in advance. So this actually you don't see as a setback. You actually see it as a process to enriching your life and it's sort of like a process of growth. Yes, absolutely. How, I mean, yes. How does, I, I, how does, I, how does I, telling I, this story contribute to your healing? Uh, this Telling the story in this book, this beautiful book, how does that contribute to where you are now? Well, it's a very strange thing. Um, when I went through the process of losing my eye, <clears throat> I had an intuition. I had an intuition that this process would help others as well as myself. And because I had to learn to see again, because I had to open myself to new kinds of perception, um, I feel that I learned a tremendous amount that gives me the opportunity to teach to others at this point. So... You know, I feel that um, uh, anything that we're given, any of the gifts we're given, any of the challenges we overcome, um, I see it as a responsibility to teach and help others who may be facing the same challenge or even may be facing different challenges, but your experience can help. Not only sharing it, would you say that this is also a creative outlet? I would say it's absolutely a creative outlet. When I lost my eye, it ushered in a whole new period of, of creative work. It, it, um, it opened me up to the world and people. I have to say, you know, when I was in my 20s, I was rather self-absorbed. I didn't think a great deal about um, the world, and I certainly cared about other, other people, but they weren't my primary focus. When I lost my eye, <clears throat> I felt it expanded my perception. I became much more empathetic, much more compassionate, much more aware of conditions in the world. And I feel that it, it gave me a perspective that was outward facing rather than inward facing. And I began to recognize how petty so many of my concerns were before losing my eye. Wow. So this is a great time to take a break. This is Dr. Janine Kokorard talking with David Ulrich about his latest books in camera, Creative Awakening with Daily Practice in Photography. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Everybody buckle up. Buckle up. Buck, buckle up. Buckle up. Every, 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 everybody. Buckle up. Buck, buckle up. Buck, buckle up. Everybody. Buckle up. Let's go. Buckle up. Can we go to the store? Can we get some ice cream? Everybody, buckle up. Everybody, buckle up. 
A lot goes on in the car, but remember, you're in control. Stand firm. Only move when you hear the click that says they're buckled in. Never give up until they buckle up. Learn more at safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. We now return to your family's health on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. And welcome back to Your Family's Health on the Voice of NAS Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Dr. Janine Kukarard, and today our special guest is David Ulrich. His most recent book, Zen Camera, Creative Awakening with a Daily Practice in Photography. Welcome back, David. Well, thank you. Keith has a question for you. Okay. All right, so I've read that Zen tradition teaches that every moment, moment in our lives, we have a choice. Can you explain what that means and how our friend lis- friends listening right now can use you as a camera to get closer to Zen? <laughs> well, uh, most of the time, um, as we live our lives, we're highly distracted. We may be in a moment of certain kinds of activities, but we're thinking about what we're going to cook for dinner. We're thinking about something that happened last night. Our mind is constantly chattering. What does it mean to be present to this moment, to be here in the activity that we're in and not thinking about something else or, you know, looking down at our screen? I think that um, photography is something that can help us become more attentive to the world around us. It can help us become more aware of our relationship to the world around us. And it brings us directly into this moment because a, a, a photograph is something that takes place in a moment. And you have to be attentive to the unfolding scene in front of you in order to capture the moment in an interesting and compelling way. You talk in your book about um, Zen Camera's six lessons. Tell us about those six lessons that we can learn from. Well, the first lesson is observation. And, and observation means can we observe the world and can we observe ourselves in it? What are our points of connection to the world? Um, when I ask my students, how many of you spend you know, an hour or two a day just looking at the world, nobody raises their hand. When I ask them, how many of you spend at least three or four hours a day looking at some kind of screen, some kind of mediated impression, everybody raises their hand. So the first lesson is observation. The need to have a keen and ongoing observation of life around us. The second lesson is identity. Who am I? What are my strengths? What are my obstacles? How do I fit within this world? How do I define myself? You know, many people take selfies. I think it's a a natural activity. It's a way of seeking acknowledgement. It's a way of helping to understand our identity. The third lesson is awareness. The broad awareness that we are able to have of ourselves and the world simultaneously. One of the interesting things about being a photographer is you are seeking points of resonance with the world. Where does your inner world interact with the outer world? And that can be found through a broad embracing awareness. The next lesson is practice. In order to do anything well, we need to practice it The next lesson is mastery. What does the author uh, Malcolm Gladwell claims that it takes 10,000 hours of practice to become good, good at anything? And the final lesson is presence. As a photographer, we seek to connect to the presence, the essence of people or things in the world. And we seek to express and discover something of our own presence. So these six lessons are evolutionary. You move from one to the other. And a camera becomes a way of helping you discover yourself and discover your points of connection to the world around you. I love those lessons. Can can anyone learn to be visually literate? 
Absolutely. In fact, we're a culture <clears throat> that depends heavily on photography. How many people are on Instagram? It's now about a billion. Yeah. And how many people are using photographs and images as a means of communication in their everyday life? But yet, none of those people have been trained visually. <clears throat> I firmly believe in high school or college, everybody should take a required course, you know, called uh, visual culture, visual literacy, something like that. <clears throat> Laszlo Moholy Naj, the head of the Bauhaus Design School in the U.S. said, the illiterate of the future will be ignorant of the pen and camera alike. Mm. So I think visual literacy uh, is becoming necessary as part of our cultural lexicon. This is interesting. So how about self-portraits? What, what can we learn about self-portraits when we take pictures of ourselves coming from a professional photographer like you? I understand the need to take selfies. We all need to feel loved and acknowledged. We all need to um, explore our self-image, our body image. But I think a physical selfie is a shallow reflection. You can also use the camera as a way to explore the deeper sides of your character. I ask my students the question, if you were an animal, what kind of animal would you be? It's a game we often play in childhood. And we go around the room and people say what kind of animal they would be. When we start thinking like that, we're thinking in metaphor. And you can photograph your inner landscape in a metaphoric way by seeing it reflected in the outer world. That's a far deeper kind of selfie than just simply how I look in a given moment or how I look after my haircut or what meal I just ate and how that looks on a plate. <clears throat> you know, can we find our points of resonance with the world in a way that helps us in a deeper process of self-discovery. You're listening to Your Family's Health on the Voice of NASA Community College, 90.3 WHPC, and today our special guest is David Ulrich, and he's talking about his recent book called Zen Camera, Creative Awakening with a Daily Practice in Photography. So, David, um, Keith has another question for you. Yes, All go right, for David. it. So, you say that we do not see with our eyes alone and that attention, empathy, and being in tune with your inner world plays a key role in your creative process. Please, right. Please explain. Right. Well, we don't see through our eyes alone. Our whole body is involved in seeing. So, you know, there's a mountain climber who's blind and he's able to see by electrodes attached to his tongue. Basically, impressions come in from the world and they touch all of our senses. They touch our eyes, they touch our ears, they touch our sense of touch, our sense of smell. And we can engage the whole body in the act of seeing. You know, empathy comes from being able to stand in another person's shoes. You actually can put your attention inside another person and know rather directly what they're feeling, maybe even to some degree what they're thinking. And empathy becomes a powerful way of understanding the world and others. And it comes through the whole body. It's not just through the eyes. We sense, we feel. Oftentimes when I'm looking out at the world, I sense and I feel the colors that I see in the world within my body. They, they vibrate like a tuning fork and they awaken different sensations within. So our bodies are profoundly connected to the exterior world and by paying inward attention, by looking inward, by being mindful, we can become more aware of the kind of responses that we have to both things in the world and to other people. Wow. What would you say to someone who is or has experienced a loss of a body part or maybe a family member who has experienced a loss of a body part? What would be the perfect thing to say to them or what would be the right thing to say? Do you say I'm sorry? What do you say? 
Well, I mean, of course, we, we want to show concern. But I think the most important thing is I don't think we in this culture <clears throat> have any idea of the amount of strength, the amount of grit. I know you had a, a, a show uh, with the author of Grit. I don't think we have any idea the amount of grit and resilience and strength that we have within. It's unfortunate that an injury is what's often needed to bring us to an awareness of this strength and this resilience. But I think if we quiet the mind, I think it's incumbent upon us to stop being so distracted and to move an attention into the body, to be mindful. I think that we have strength within that exceeds anything in our deepest imagination. So, if one of our friends listening wanted to get in touch with you for more information, what would be the best way to uh, reach out to you? Well, I have a website. It's uh, www.creativeguide.com. Uh, a lot of my writing, my books, um, the photographs that I do are on the website. Uh, my Zen camera book is on the website. And my contact information. Uh, I'm totally open to people contacting me. I prefer the modality of email. But my web place, my website would be the place to start. And it's a beautiful book. And looking at the covers, very nice. What is, what is one parting thought that you would like to leave our, our audience with, with us today? One parting thought is, I think it's really important to look up. You know, don't spend so much time looking down at your screen. The world is wondrous. The world is multi-sided. The world is complex. The act of looking, the act of seeing is itself a learning experience. Direct perception is probably our most important way of understanding the world and learning about ourselves. I would say look around use your eyes, engage in a creative pursuit, and <clears throat> you will learn a great deal. Well, thank you, David, Mr. David Ulrich, professional photographer and author of Zen Camera, Creative Awakening with a Daily Practice in Photography. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Janine. I, I appreciated our conversation, and I hope it helped your listeners in some way. This is Dr. Janine cook Garrard, and I'm here with Keith Garbarino, nursing student from the nursing department here at NASA Community College. And we thank you for listening to this week's edition of Your Family's Health.